Good morning and welcome back to the Arise Bible Study and Fellowship. I am Pastor Stephen and we, the Arise family, are excited to have you joining us today. We're continuing our study in Genesis uh, and we'll be in chapter 18 and we've been going through all of Genesis. We've started in Genesis 1, moved all the way forward now into 18. We encourage you if you are, if this is your first time watching one of our, our teachings, please go back to the first video, January 31st. Uh, and start there because we're building on that foundation as always we want to remind you of that please take notes uh, you're going to need those notes because our, our desire here at the Rise Bible Study and Fellowship is to teach you so that you can teach others uh, so we, we certainly need to learn for ourselves but once we learn we want to make sure that we have our notes so that we can teach others what we're learning uh, so sharing is caring okay all right so let's go ahead and open up with prayer and then we'll go ahead and get started Father, we just thank you right now. Thank you, Lord God, for a new day where we can rejoice and be glad in it. New mercies and new grace. Thank you, God, for being available to us. Thank you, God, for working through us. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for your people. Open our hearts, oh God. Open our minds, oh God, this morning, oh God, as we receive the word. Bless Pastor Stephen and anyone on the call who to share oh god and again don't let us just be hearers of the word but to be doers oh god so that we can reflect your will in this earth that your kingdom may come as it is in heaven god we give you glory we give you honor we give you praise in Jesus name. amen thank you keisha thank you so much so we want to start off right from the beginning just to remind you if you're watching this video or listening to this recording through podcast or any other means you're not here by chance this is a divine appointed moment a divinely appointed moment moment and god wants you to know that he wants to speak to you and this is one way that he does that is through his word as we study god's word we, we say that we're climbing god's holy mountain to meet with him just like moses in genesis saw the burning bush and was drawn to climb the mountain to meet with God. We believe that the Arise Bible Study and Fellowship uh, was created by God and given to us for that same purpose to draw you close to him uh, so that you can hear his word and get instructions, but most importantly, to know who he is. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. God wants you to know not only that he is, but that he is God. And part of us understanding that is reading his word. His word is his will. And as we read his word, we start to understand who he is. And in doing so, we start to realize that God has a plan for our life, for this world, for the time we live in. Um, things aren't just happening. There's no, no, um, no consequences. What's not consequences? There's no, um, what's it called? The, well, anyway, there's, there, things aren't just happening by chance. God is, um, God is actually ordaining everything in the earth and he's allowing things to happen and allowing us to understand when we read his word, what exactly it is and where we are. And that's why we read the word, right? So, uh, coincidences. Thank you so much. Tell I appreciate that. The word is coincidence. Uh, so, um, so anyway, so we want to get into God's word. It's not boring at all today. It's going to be one of the most revealing, exciting times. We're going to actually look at how the, what happened in Genesis has affected us today. Now, that's, you know, that's going to amaze some of you, but I'm telling you, if you, if you hang with us, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 18, and we're going to continue our study uh, in Genesis chapter 18. Uh, and I'll go ahead and bring this up so that we can all literally be on the same page, and I'll share my screen. Here we go. There we go. All right. And so just by way of recap, as we always do here on the rise, is we take a look back at what we did in our last episode, our last session. Uh, and we know that um, uh, Abraham has come to a place now where he's waiting for God's promise for his son to be born, his first uh, son through his wife, Sarah. Uh, and he's waiting, and then these angels walk up to him in, in verse 18. And it says, Men, uh, and the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. And we know later on as he goes through the whole process of talking with him and God reaffirms that he's going to give him this child and Sarah laughs at that, by the way. Uh, and then God says uh, to Sarah, indeed, you will have a child in your old age. He confirms that uh, even though Sarah denied that she laughed, but she did. Uh, but it's all good. And uh, and then God says to to uh, Abraham just before he leaves, he says, should I hide what I'm about to do to Abraham? Because he came down to judge the city of Sodom. 
Sodom and Gomorrah is a pagan city uh, full of sinful sexual sin and, and just murder. Uh, and God's come down to see if what everyone is saying about, about that city and praying about that city is true. Uh, and then he says to Abraham, you know, should I tell you? And the reason why he's saying that is because Lot is there. Uh, Lot is Abraham's nephew, and um, he used to be with Abraham, but he left Abraham and decided to do his own thing. And he decided to move um, to the plains of Sodom so he could grow crops and do all that, and his family got blessed. Uh, then eventually we see he moved inside the city of Sodom, probably for protection, uh, because it uh, it was a walled city and, 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 uh, and had an army and all that. So he probably moved inside just from a protection standpoint, but over time things happened wrong. Uh, but anyway... Um, we see that Abraham is interceding for the city and asking God, you know, are you going to destroy the whole city? Or it, maybe if there's some righteous people there, will you save the city because the righteous people are there? And God said, yeah, I will. And Abraham started off with 50. If there are 50 righteous, will you destroy the city? And God was like, for 50, I will not destroy the city. And it got all the way down to 10. Abraham kept asking, well, what about 45? What about 35? What about, you know, he kept asking them until they got down to 10. And the Lord said, you know, if there's 10 righteous, I will not destroy the city. So God was willing to talk with him through the whole process and allow him to negotiate in a sense for how God was going to dole out his judgment into the earth. Uh, and we see that God wants to participate with us. And that's what we, in our last episode, last uh, video, we actually talked about how God uh, will speak to us and God will give us uh, a moment to talk back with him about what he's about to do in the earth. So today we're going to look at this and this is what you need to write down. We're going to look at how God saves the righteous from destruction. And we're going to look at Lot. Lot is rescued. All right. Uh, we're going to go into Genesis chapter 19 and we're going to see this. We're going to see also see God judging a sinful, unrepentant people in Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a time where God gives for repentance. And then once that time has passed, here comes judgment. Um, and then the consequences of not listening to God in your deliverance. Do you know, in fact, God can be delivering you out of something and you decide that you're going to add to it you're going to change it because you somehow think you you have you're wiser than god and then you end up calling yourself causing yourself more problems when to look at that the result of not listening to the lord and doing what you want and that's the problem that's been the problem since genesis chapter one with you know in the beginning with genesis chapter one two and three when we see that man was made and adam and eve were there and they decided to to do what they wanted they were given instructions but because we have our own will sometimes we can get in the way uh, I, I told somebody once that, uh, you know, when God is talking, sometimes we go, but, you know, but God, but, you know, and I'm going to teach a sermon called get your butt out of the way. Uh, so anyway, so and then the last thing is how Lot's sin impacts his wife, his daughters and future generations. My goal is to cover all of this today. So it's a whole lot. So let's go ahead and jump into it and get started. We're in Genesis chapter 19. God rescues Lot. Uh, and so the and we covered this yesterday part of this yesterday the two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom uh, And when Lot saw them he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said my lords Please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet And then you may rise up early and go on your way They said no we will spend the night in the town square Which is not advisable when you're in sin city because you can be destroyed by what happens at night um, but Lot, in verse 3, but he pressured, he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now, we know this city, Sodom and Gomorrah, was, was known for what we call sodomy, so homosexuality and all that was rampant, sexual sins of all kinds, bestiology, you know, pedophilia, like all of that was rampant in Sodom, and just horrible, uh, and that's why these angels are coming down to destroy this city. Um, but before they lay down, the men of the city, and this, the men, all of them, the men of, the, of Sodom, both young and old, and all the people to the last man surrounded the house. Now, let's stop right here because we're about to see this judgment, but we also see how God came to Abraham first to tell him what he was going to do in the earth, right? And oftentimes the guy does that throughout the Bible. He'll come and tell a righteous man what he's about to do. He did that with Noah. We're seeing him doing that with Moses. He's doing that with, with Abraham. All right, so this is a pattern that God follows, which shows you God has a, a way he does things, right? So um, verse 5, and they called to Lot. And these are the men in the city trying to come get those men out the house. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us. And so basically, they wanted the, these men to come out so they could rape them is what it came down to. Uh, and then verse 11, we'll jump down to verse 11. And <clears throat> when the two angels came out, 
uh, because they had had enough. Verse 10, but the men reached out their hands and brought light into the house with them and shut the door. So those two angels pulled light in. Verse 11, and they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they were they, they wore themselves out groping for the door. So all of them were struck blind. That was their part of the judgment. Then the men said to Lot, have you, have you, these are the two angels now, have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against it uh, is its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out, now look at this. So Lot went out, and I want you to think about Noah, because Noah built that ark, it took over 100 years, and his family ignored his warnings, his extended family, his wife and his three sons and their daughters listened. I mean, their wives listened. But look what Lot, Lot, Lot does. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, see, those two daughters had, had um, soon-to-be husbands, sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city, but he seen to his sons-in-laws to be jesting. And you, this might happen in your own life, where things are happening and you're telling them, you're telling the people around you what God is saying, and they're not listening to you. They just, for some odd reason, they can't see you, they can't hear you, their ears are stopped. Well, here's a case for that right here. Even though Lot was in his heart trying to really plead with them, they thought he was joking. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, that she be swept away in the punishment of the city. All right, we're going to start right here. First thing we got to we got to realize is these verses right here, uh, 14 and 15. Number one, although you've been talking to your family, trying to get them to come to Christ, telling them you know how to live a godly life and trying to encourage them planting seeds and watering seeds, you know they have a part in that, and, and some of them think it's a joke. I don't need to go to church. Why do I need to go to church? I mean, you know, and they'll make up all excuses why they won't do it, but they'll stay out in the world. You know, they'll watch nasty stuff on TV and horrible videos and say, repeat all them nasty, horrible songs. And, and I ain't even judge them because I used to do that. Okay, so it's not a judgment. This is a just truth. All right. And there's a point where they come to where a person who loves them are telling them the truth and they decide they don't want to hear it. So they think it's a joke. And not only that, it says, In morning dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters. And this is important to you. Now, this is, I'm going to stop right here. Just I just sense that I need to take a moment because sometimes Christians, we think we're God. We think we're Holy Spirit in people's lives. And we just try to, you know, act like we can create things in people's lives. But this is not true. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here. We have instructions to do what God says to do. Lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. Do you know if you don't detach and leave the place where God's going to destroy, you will be destroyed. And it wasn't and it wasn't even God's plan or will for you to be destroyed. It was an act of your will to stay in a place where you should not be around the people you should not be around because they're going to face God's judgment. And if you think for a second that just because you're there, that somehow God's not going to judge those people, you're wrong. And you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer punishment. It says punishment because that, that sin or whatever is happening in that environment is so against God's will that he warned you first so that you could leave. But if we don't heed God's warning, we will suffer. All right. Look what it says, verse 16. But he lingered. He lingered. You ever, you ever come to somebody and say, look, we're about to, matter of fact, let's just say y'all going on a trip and y'all got to catch a plane. But the person who's going with you, not even packing. They're not even moving fast. There's no urgency in them. This is what's happening right here. But he lingered. So the men seized him. Now, this is one of the rare moments in the Bible where you see the angels actually grab somebody like this. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful. Why did he grab him? Because the Lord is being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. They had to move him. They had to move him. Because God knew that in, in, in the heart that Abraham had as he was interceding, he was actually interceding for Lot in his family. And God loves Abraham so much, he was like, okay, I'm going to make sure we get them out before I destroy the city. Verse 17, and as they brought them out, one said, escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. All right, here we go. Again, and one thing I talk about, we talk about a lot here on the rise is God gives instructions. God tells us what to do. And if we listen, we'll be all right. And if we don't, well, we'll suffer the consequences. They brought them out and told them, escape for your life. 
Number two, do not look back or stop. That's easy enough to understand. He says, do not look back or stop. That's a simple, simple instruction. He says, don't stop anywhere in the valley. He told him, escape where? To the hills, lest you be swept away. So not only did he say, if you're in the city, you're going to die. He says, as you're running, if you look back or you stop and hesitate, you will die. Because you're going to be in the valley where the destruction is happening at. you got to escape to the hills. God is telling us that if we don't go come up higher, and if we don't allow the instruction he's already given us to take us there, that we might suffer a longer period of punishment and destruction in our own lives. We can't stay in the valley of our sins. We can't continue to do the things that God told us not to do. You know, we got to make sure that we're moving when God says move. Why? Because there's consequences if we don't. Verse 18, and Lot said to them, oh no, my lords. I'm sorry. Hold a second. Hold a second. These angels snatched him and his family out the city, told them to run for their life. Lot is now stopping them to say, okay, I heard you say go to the city, but now he got an idea. Look what he says. And Lot said to them, oh no, my lords, behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But, there's that word. I'm going to highlight that. I'm going to highlight that because we need to remember this. But, I cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Oh, so now you you know what's going to happen now? Now all of a sudden you have a plan and you know what's going to happen in the future? This is the problem we have. We often fear the instructions and we make up from our fear a false reality in our future, which causes us to get into further sin. I cannot escape to the hills. He told him to run to the hills. So obviously if, he told, if the Lord said to do it, then of course he can do it. I cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. I, you know what? This is what I want. I want y'all to remember this. I want y'all to remember this because this is a lesson for your own life. I'm going to change that color. I don't like that color. All right, we're going to change that. But I cannot. How many times have we told the Lord we can't do something? Lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Now look what happens. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. So he pointed over to another city. He said, let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also that I will, will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. Now look, he was given instructions by God to run to the hills. He decided to make up his own instructions as he was running on his way. As he was going on his way, he decided that he was going to add to what God gave him to do. God says, run to the hills. He says, no, I'm going to run to that city over there. How many times have we, when God told us to do something, gave us clear instructions to do something, we added to what God said. And when we got what we wanted, we realized that's not what we wanted. We got into a vision or, or, or a work of the Lord or something in our church we were participating in or something in our family we decided to do or not do. And then all of a sudden we realized that caused a problem in our life. We have to stop doing that. There's a point where we just need to be obedient. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And right now, Lot sacrificing a lot because he's adding his butt. Remember I said that word right there? But. He put his big old but I cannot into, into God's instructions. Now see what happens. God destroys Sodom. Verse 23. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah. That's two cities, by the way. Sodom is a city and Gomorrah is a city. God reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah. Sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. All right, that's destruction from above. And he overthrew those cities and, and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground, but Lot's wife behind him. Oh, let me stop right there. Let me stop right there and let me stop this. He said he overthrew all the cities, right? He overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. He overthrew them with fire from heaven. With, with What did he say? He said with fire and brimstone. Now, I, I, I definitely, if you've never seen a depiction of, of how that looks I want to show that to you this morning we're gonna be looking at some stuff today he told him to flee don't look back because destruction is coming from above and that's what was happening his wrath was coming down and they were supposed to flee and not look back and matter of fact it happened so quickly if you think about it when that fire and brimstone was coming down people were running through the streets they were on fire the houses were on fire I mean it was total utter destruction and God was trying to save Lot and his wife and his two daughters from that destruction because the judgment was coming. Judgment is coming again the same way on the earth. God is about to destroy this earth the same exact judgment for sin. 
and it's a sin from the garden. We know this whole thing that's rolling forward from Genesis is because of sin in the garden and God is restoring all those things. And so there's a process that man has to go through. And we've been following the line from Adam to Seth and Seth to Noah and Noah to Abraham as, as God is bringing this line of men through so that the Christ could come to the earth through that line. And we're following that line. That's what this whole Bible study is all about, is the promise that God gave Adam and Eve in the garden that through the woman would come a seed that would destroy, destroy Satan's head and he would bruise his heel. And that man is coming through is going to be Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. So, uh, and this destruction is coming again because, of, of course, men is... You know, we know how rampant sin is on the earth and everything that's happening on the earth. And we're going to get into that. But we're going to see the consequences from the decisions that were made by Lot. And you can see how Lot, you know, came up with his big idea on how he wanted God to move and what he wanted God to do. Uh, and we're going to see what happens as a result of that. Um, and, and then from there, we're going to see how it actually impacts us today. Because, you know, to a large degree, people think the Bible is like old. Like that's something that happened a long time ago. Like. 27, 2800 years ago, and you know what? It's, it don't even matter. It, it doesn't apply to us today. Well, it's not even true because the ripple effects from the things that happened in the garden are still impacting us today, and everything that happens after that impacts us today because we're descendants from Adam and Eve. Everybody on the planet, God only made one race, the human race, and everyone came from Adam and Eve. And once God destroyed everything, Noah's family was left. The only ones alive, the only humans alive was Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives, and everyone came from them when he restarted so we're all cousins on this planet I don't care how different we look we all come from the same uh, family all right so the human race all right so let's get back into uh, the text let me bring this back up so we can continue here all right so verse 23 the sun had risen on the earth when light came to Zohar then the Lord rained down Sodom Sodom and Gomorrah on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven and overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the city see he told him to get out the valley too. And what grew on, and, and whatever grew on the ground. But Lot's wife, but Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. What in the world? So, what does that mean? That means not only was Lot being disobedient, coming up with his own ideas, but his wife. His wife suffered because she didn't heed the instructions of the angels. The angels told her not to look back. Told them not to look back. Why? Because... Looking back is you feeling like you, you're losing something. And God's like, no, I'm setting you free. Always look forward. And in our own lives, we can't look back at our sin and desire the things we used to be. Now, you got to remember, coming out of that city, they left their family and their friends there. And so if you desire the things from your past more than what God's doing in your present and what he's going to do in your future, there's a consequence to that. There's a consequence to that. And so I want to share that real quick. And I'm going to show you guys. I wanted you to see this. I found this video clip and we're going to watch this and then we'll we'll continue. And this is Lot, his wife and his two daughters being delivered out of Sodom and Gomorrah by the angels and God's destruction on those cities. And uh, let me make this big and then we'll go ahead and get started. Let me turn that up. Here we go. You must get away. The city is being punished. disobeying God. Lot and his daughters flee to the mountains, never to see Abraham again. Goodness gracious. That, that's what I'm talking about. That's exactly what happened. And um, his wife, because of her disobedience, uh, suffered that destruction. She didn't have to. It was something that just occurred. And actually, you know, um, you know when we talk about that, you know that his wife was turned to a pillar of salt uh, as a as a part of the judgment 
That's a real thing. I mean, this is not just a story. This is something that actually happened on the earth. Just like when we talked about um, Noah's Ark. People are like, that's not even true. That's just a story. It's not even true. They found Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat. I showed you guys. There's a video that shows you the outline of the boat and everything. So uh, this stuff actually happened on the earth. And so there's a place actually where you'll find this. This is that pillar of salt. They believe that this pillar of salt right here is Lot's wife. And it's an actual place on the earth. Matter of fact, I wanted to show you guys. This is where it's at. Sodom and Gomorrah. It's in Sodom and Gomorrah on the top of that hill. Lot's wife, pillar of salt, and Amon, Jordan. And Amon, Jordan. So this is not, you know, make-believe. I mean, this stuff is real. It actually happened. And one thing that you should understand when it comes to the Bible, the Bible is very specific about when and where things happen. And so we have to take a look at that. So this is where, so just so you can know for yourself, this is where it says it happened. It happened right there. Italy, there's, there's uh, not Pompeii. Uh, it's in Am Ammon, Jordan. I pulled up the wrong one. Let me pull up the right one. It's in Ammon, Jordan. So let me, oh, no, that's, oh, thank you. That's exactly what I was going to do. Okay, so let me go back. So what I wanted to share with you was that, you know, when, when destruction comes, sometimes it's so quick that there's nothing you can do about it. And that's what I wanted to talk about was Pompeii. I don't know if you heard about Pompeii uh, and the destruction of the people in Pompeii, but that was in Italy back uh, a long time ago. There was a volcanic, uh, you see the volcano over here. There was a volcanic eruption and that mountain just basically blew up and lava went everywhere. And this, this was, uh, you see it's, con it's connected, it's part of Italy. Uh, and that destruction happened so fast, the people were in the street, just like the day of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were running for their lives. That lava and that um, the ash and everything was just pouring through the streets to the point where a lot of them were petrified like this. They died just like this is an actual two bodies in Pompeii covered with uh, lava, ash and all of that. And there's hundreds and hundreds of those bodies. And so when, we, when we're talking about what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah uh, and what happened with uh, Pompeii is similar because the, the same thing happened in terms of destruction of the city by fire and 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 all that brimstone and so anyway we don't really know exactly how the brimstone fell to earth but we know it did matter of fact it's still brimstone in Sodom there's still brimstone in Sodom uh, so you can go there today and pick it up the ash is still on the ground all of that and I've actually seen videos where that ash will still catch on fire it still catches on fire okay you can light it <laughs> So yeah, it's 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 a real thing. And no matter and this is the thing about, you know, man, because we know the devil does not want the truth to come out. And so those who are in power don't want us to believe in God. They want us to believe in government. They want us to believe in them. So they'll hide all these truths. They'll hide them all. You know, and they'll try to try to act like it doesn't even exist. Why? Because if you believe if you can believe there's a God, then you can stop believing in them. And they don't want that. And one thing about Power is power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it's a global plan that the devil has for destruction of mankind. And he's working through men to do that, men and women on this planet to do that, promising them power and prestige and all those things. But God says, what does it profit a man to gain the world and lose your soul? And so a lot of those people who are working for the devil, who are hiding all these facts. Um, matter of fact, read Romans chapter 1. And towards the end of the chapter, it will tell you what will happen to them. It tells you. Uh, God's plan for them. But anyway, let's get back into uh, the lesson for today. We're in, uh, we're talking about Lot. We're in Genesis and we're in chapter 19. Um, and we're looking at, uh, we're at the end and we're looking at Lot's and his daughter, what happens with Lot and his daughters. All right. So let's see what happens next. Now Lot went up to Zoar and lived in the hills with his two daughters. Oh, that's great. For he was afraid to live in Zoar. So the city he wanted to escape to, he didn't even get to. He left. I mean, he didn't even stay. He left because he was afraid to stay there, right? So he he lived in a cave with his two daughters. His wife is now dead. It's him and his two daughters. Let's see what happens in this next generation of disobedience. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come in to us after the manner of all the earth, which means to, to have intercourse so they could have children. Verse 32, Come. Let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, have sex with our father, is what that says, um, and that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose, because he was drunk. Verse 34, the next day the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, 
I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him, and that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father uh, drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. So both his daughters basically raped him, got him drunk and raped him. Verse 36, thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son called his name Moab. All right, remember that. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name Benami. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. Now, y'all know we're going to have to slow down right here. Because this is, I mean, the Bible is one of the most interesting books. It's better than soap operas. It's better than movies. I mean, this this is crazy. These two girls got saved by these angels and lot to. The mom died because she was disobedient. But they saw that city get destroyed because of sin. They saw that. But even though God delivered them in such a great deliverance, they decided to do this, commit this evil sin against their father. And he got drunk and, and, and both his daughters got pregnant. And both of them had, had children. Now, now, what I want you to know is sin begets sin. And when they raped their father and got pregnant, that child inside of them became a child of greater sin. Because you see how it progresses. You know, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden by eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They come out, their first son, Cain, gets even more sinful, even more evil. Cain kills his, his little brother, Abel. So murder happened right in the second generation. God delivers Lot and his two daughters out with a wonderful thing, praise the Lord. The very next thing they do is a greater sin than what happened in, in Sodom and Gomorrah, which is to lay with their fathers and their father and get pregnant. And both of them got pregnant. And let me tell you, there's a consequence to that. And this actually still affects us today because it tells you right here, the firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites. Well then, who is the Moabites? This is an actual people. You should be asking that question. Who are the Moabites even today? The younger also bore a son and called his name Benami. He is the father of the Ammonites. Well then, who are the Ammonites uh, of today? Because these two Moabites and Ammonites, these two people groups are born out of just treachery and evil. So who are they? Great question. Let's take a look. And I pulled this up ahead of time so we could take a look at this. So what we want to do is we want to understand that Ammon was an ancient Semitic speaking nation occupying the East Jordan River between the torrent valleys of Arnon and Jabbok in the present day Jordan. All right. So that's that's what it is. Right. Now, check this out. I want to show you something about them. Who are where is Ammon? First off, where is Ammon Jordan? Let's take a look at that. All right. Let me move this out of the way. Look at this. This is Ammon Jordan. Okay, so what's the big deal about that? This is present day Ammon Jordan. Let's just back up a little bit and take a look at what we're looking at. This is the Dead Sea. Oh, and there's Jerusalem. There's Jericho. Why is this significant? Because down here is Sodom and Gomorrah. And those daughters, their, their descendants set up um, their homes here and Ammon. All right, so, okay, big deal about that. So they moved and they're up there. Okay, what's the big deal? Well, they decided that they didn't want to serve God. They wanted to serve their own gods. And this was the God they served. And I'm going to go back one step. And um, let's see. Uh, the Moabites served uh, their God is, oh, let me go back. Here you go. There we go. Let me back up a little bit. This is their God. And and what they decided they wanted to do was the children that were born, they would put the God, their God, their babies in their hands and sacrifice their children. This was their this was their uh, one of their rituals for their God. They would actually kill their babies. Let me move to the next next tab here. All right. So this is Molech. This is their God. OK, well, that happened in the Old Testament. So what, what's the big deal? No, this is present day. This is Molech present day and look read, read the caption here the statue the statue on display at the Roman Colosseum is similar to this depiction of the pagan deity Moloch, Moloch from the the National Cinema Museum in in Turin Italy you see it that's that thing is is on the earth today now look at it and look at look at look at the the way they created it let me see if I there we go that's a better picture of it that's Moloch, the God that came from the sin. 
So why is that significant to us? Because we don't understand that when, when those daughters sinned, they created something on the earth that the devil has been using. Look at the symbols on, on, on this thing. What do you see? You see stars in their hands. You see the sun. You see this one, two, three, four, five, six pointed star. You see this eye in the middle. You see all of that. So what does that mean? What does that look like? You guys have seen that symbol before. You've seen that symbol before. Where have you seen that symbol? On the U.S. dollar. Right there. Those descendants and those people groups on the planet still are moving forward with their plan. They they are still, uh, the Moabites were known for sacrificing to their gods, sacrificing babies to their god. And think about it. America has that same all-seeing eye right there. And you see that star? Look at the stars. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. seven. There's seven stars inside this hand. And if you look at um, this right here on the chest, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's a six-pointed star. Well, what does that mean? Let's take a look at the U.S. dollar. Let's look and see what's happening with our dollar. Oh, there's a star right there. One, two, three, four, five, six. The same six-pointed star. In God we trust. Really, which God are we trusting in? This stuff is real. And a lot of people say, oh, no, you're just making it up. No, this is, this is factual. And these people are still on the planet. Matter of fact, it said that you go back and it says that that's the Ammonites and then you got the Moabites. The Moabites, right? So who are the Moabites? Let's let's take a look at that. And 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 all of this, all these gods believe in the sacrifice of, ch of children. The newborn children were um it says the newborn children were the sacrifices preferred by Moloch as they considered innocent beings with greater matter. They would take their children and kill them. And let's see what the, the other sister became. Her group became the Moabites. Moabite, member of the West Semitic people who lived in the highlands of east, east of the Dead Sea, now in West Central Jordan and flourished in the 9th century. They are known principally through information given in the Old Testament and from the inscription on the Moabite stone. All right. And, uh, and what do we see? We go down here and we take a look at uh, what does Moabite symbolize? What is Moabites today? Where Israel's oh they became uh, both of these groups became the enemy of Israel the, the children of God and let's see what the Moabites who who um, where they're located here we go this is them this is Ammon this is the kingdom of Ammon this is the kingdom of Moab and this is where Sodom and Gomorrah is located you see how it's all connected and there's Jerusalem all happening in the same reason Samaria if you've been in the Bible at any length of time. You know that these names are, are you, you know some of these places. And then this is their God. And they used to burn their babies in, in the middle of this thing. Why is it why am I why am I bringing this up today? Why? Because this 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 plan that, that ha occurred because of their sin is still rolling forward to, to kill children even even today. They they love sacrificing babies. That's what they do. And I started when I was doing my research saying, Well, I see the connections to the American dollar, I see the American agenda. And what they're doing and I went and looked I went and looked it up and it says what I found it says that over 60 million babies have been aborted in America over 60 million babies have been aborted in America that's all because you go all the way back to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah you see how those daughters what they did and you see what nations came out of those daughters and again I'm telling you guys it goes all the way back to being obedient when God told Abraham, at, his, at the time his name was Abram, to take his wife and, and, and all he had and leave, he did not tell him to take Lot with him. But he took Lot. And because he took Lot with him, all this stuff is happening because he added something to what God wanted him to do. And then it moves forward. Lot, again, being delivered, he added something to what God wanted him to do. And then the next generation, his daughters, decided to make up their own mind and do what they wanted. And they added to what God's plan was for their life. And look what what happened on this earth today. We still have those people groups still on the earth, and they were they fight against God's people even to this day. And that's that's sad, but it is reality. And so that's the consequences of sin. And if we don't take heed to what the Bible says, and most people don't even know this stuff is in the Bible. Number one, as we go through this and we start reading about what's happening uh, and what God's doing, they don't even know that what happened with Lot's daughters affects us even today. And it's true. 
is exactly what affects us today. And we now that you guys seen the study, you saw me pull up the articles. That stuff is real. And those gods, those false gods, little G guys, are still on the planet. They still are making statues, still worshiping before them. And a lot of them, and you can talk to some of these abortion doctors, man, they don't have a problem with killing babies. They, matter of fact, they think they're doing a service to their God. And so we, that's what we're fighting against. You know, the Bible says we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. But again, the whole purpose is, and the whole purpose for killing all these babies is the same purpose it was when you look at, and we're going to get into this, but when you look at when Moses was born, that Pharaoh went and killed every male child because he heard the deliverer was coming. And we saw that. And we're going to see with Jesus the same thing. When Jesus was being born, the, the king who was, his name was Herod, he heard that another deliverer was coming and he went out and did the exact same thing, killed all of these babies. Same exact thing. It's the same agenda moving forward through time. Kill the babies and stop God's purpose on the earth. Every child born, every person that is delivered, um, that, that is that is born, is made in God's image and after his likeness. And the enemy wants to kill as many um, image bearers of God as possible. That's his plan all over the world. So uh, so anyway, that's, that's a part of the plan because he's trying to get to Jesus. He's trying to stop Jesus from being born. And it's not going to happen. I mean, because just like when he... You, you know, if you think about it, they were trying to kill Moses and all the babies were being killed uh, in Moses' time. And Moses' mother put them in a basket and sent them down the river. And God delivered that basket right to Pharaoh's house. And they raised the very one they were trying to kill. That's just the power of God. It's amazing. how, Of course, nobody's wiser than God. And that's what we know. And we know it to be true. So, all right. So we're going to stop right there. And, uh, and I want to open up for any questions, comments, or takeaways. Anything that stood out to you today. Or anything that shocked you. Oh, don't be shy. Well, um, a few things, actually. So, one, looking at God's character, that even in judgment, he's still faithful. He's also relational. We can commune with him. And that, that took me into how powerful intercession is. And sometimes we, we look at what's going on in the world and oftentimes we compare what's going on in the world and what seemingly is the success of sinners. But sometimes our prayers are holding up the gap. I mean, and we see that in our families because sometimes God's like, I, if you move out the way, I can do something right there. But you know, <laughs> like, wait, God, you know, I'm going to pray for him. My son. God, if you move out the way. And so, but God's judgment um, is, like you said, suffering is to bring us into obedience. And so we can just allow God to do what God does. Um, we can see some better things. Also, I looked at... Um, just the power of deliverance and repentance, the power of this great book of instructions, because I'm like, why does all this evil take place so rapidly? And so that knowledge of good and evil, that sin, that, 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 that uh, picture you showed us with the spirit and the flesh, that thing is real. And so they didn't have what we have. So they were acting off of those impulses. And, and it's, it's some, we know it's some evil working in our members. Um, and so yeah. you have this word and we got the power of Jesus and we got the blood. I mean, it just makes me more grateful for that sacrifice God made for us because fighting the flesh is, they say the battle is in the mind. I mean, it, it is a, it's a hard struggle. Forget about having anybody else in your world. I mean, it's just Adam and Eve in the garden. They had enough to contend with. Mm -hmm. Eat that fruit just from the evil in themselves. And so. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for sharing that. Matter of fact, you know, the Bible, to, to your point about us getting out of God's way. Do you know that people could be in sin and, and facing almost death, but because you're praying, you're actually covering them in their sin. And the Bible warns us against that. Matter of fact, I had to tell my mom one day because she wanted me to pray for somebody. And continue praying for them and they had years to get their life right and knowing jesus and all that and, and they were just out in just sin and i told her i said no I, i'm not gonna pray for them and she just she just man she let me have it what do you mean you're supposed to be minister you ain't you're not gonna pray for people blah blah i mean she just let me have it i told her i said i'm not because see it's more important that we do god's god's will and not our own will right this is the thing and if you don't read his word you don't know his will 
And I knew that's where she was coming from. And I, so I decided, I said, look, let's take a look. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's take a look at that real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And, and look what it says. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. That means his son is having sex with one of his wives. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he hath... You know what? Let's, this half stuff. Let's change this. Let's go back. Let's go to the English Standard Version so we can get it clearer. All right. So let's... All right. There we go. We're on BibleGateway.com just in case you guys are wondering. All right. And uh, verse 2. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in spirit. And as and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. Verse 4, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus. Verse 5, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Look. Look at this. It's telling us. Now look, there's a time where it comes where this person, let him, that this person has done that, be removed from amongst you. You know, it's a hard thing to cast people out of a church. And open, there be open blatant sin in the choir, in the pulpit, and in the pews. And nobody's being kicked out. Everybody's been allowed to stay in imposition. Why? Because, you know, there's sin, sin, when sin is allowed from the head, then the body just automatically is going to go into sin. And so, but it says that when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and and then my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus. You are to deliver this man to Satan. Man, if you told somebody in the Bible that Paul told people to deliver people to Satan, to give them over to Satan. Why? For at the destruction of their flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. There's a whole teaching right there. There's a whole teaching right there. But the reality is that God, you look at the prodigal son, and that's what he's saying. Cast that person out. Let them go do what they want to do. When they're out there, they, they, they have a chance to come to themselves. And then in the end, they'll come back to God with the right heart. And their soul will be saved in the end. Let Satan have his way with them in the world. And when they get beat up enough, they might come back to themselves and realize they had a better way they were at. And come back with a repentant heart. And God will save them. Right? That's what it's saying. Great point there, Keisha. All right. Anybody else have anything they want to share? Anything that stood out? I was just going to say quickly, I thought it was... Uh, I've heard the story about Lot's wife, uh, but to actually see the depiction of her being turned into a pillar of salt and that that uh, statue is still there. Mm -hmm. um, but you talked about the things to take away today, not listening to God in your deliverance. And don't look back. Mm. Lord knows, look don't back. do that. Um, I would add that, um, number one, um, I guess without having done a deep study on Sodom and Gomorrah, um, today is the first time that I realized they are two cities. And so, um, because they are often said just together, um, I was like, well, that's good news. Um, not as good news that it was too bad in corrupt cities, but um, it's just another arsenal in the tool belt because um, mm -hmm. we want to be able to always rightly divide the word of truth. Um, and then um, just the sharing of Lot's daughters and um, the looking at the dollar bill because to the believer, when we say in God we trust, uh, we're thinking it's the one true and living God. Um, but then when you start looking at um, what the symbols are pointing to, um, it could be maybe not the God that we think it is. Mm -hmm. And so that was just all good stuff. Um, I have been um, kind of multitasking and really trying to, to listen. Uh, but I also have a 10 o'clock deadline and I'm running a little bit behind, but it was just some good stuff. Um, and so I was glad to chime in and get um, that that I was able to hear. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, this is, you know, what we're learning is the truth. And, and one thing we do on the Rise Bible Study and Fellowship is we, we absolutely want you to know the facts. And those facts can be found in, 
in history. This stuff is is documented. All of it is well documented. So it's not like we're just reading from the Bible and saying you need to believe the Bible because it's the Bible. No, the one thing about the Bible is it is so specific that you can reference, you can cross reference it with extra biblical material and see that it's so that the the places are real, the timing is right, like all of that is rolled out and it's true. Um, and that's the thing about God. God desires for us to know the truth. Why? Because he wants that truth to set us free. He wants us to get to a place where we can believe what he says because he said it and that his word is being confirmed by signs following, that these things are actually signs that point back to the fact that the Bible is real, the Bible is true. And if you told people that the Moabites and the Ammonites still had gods on this planet and they're still being worshipped and babies are still being sacrificed, most, most people wouldn't even believe you. They're like, see, that's what's wrong, y'all. Y'all just keep making up stuff. No, this stuff is true. And I just showed it to you. And I encourage you to take um, to copy the, the video clip for this for today and send it to other people. It's going to scare them, but you can at least have a conversation around it so they so that they know that God's word is true, that he's still speaking, but only those who have an ear to hear will hear. It's not our job to make people uh, follow God, follow Christ, to know God's word. It's not our job. Our job is to present uh, the love of God to them and the word of God to them, and then it's on them. They have their own will, and you have to release them. Uh, and allow them to go through their process of learning, growing, and uh, hopefully coming to repentance to know God for themselves. Um, so we're going to transition right into, um, well, before I do that, does anybody have anything else they want to share before we get into uh, today's inspiration? Telly. I do, yes. Um, as others have mentioned, it was so helpful to be able to see the um, depictions um, and the examples. And I, what stood out to me most is uh, seeing the picture of Molech, uh, because I have heard about um, Baal and Molech, and that being directly, um, di directly, like there's a direct correlation between like abortion, what we're seeing now. And uh, it's so important for us to know that as believers, because for those of us, I'm sure who might have, you know, who there's some believers that I've met that actually are in support of that or don't really know too much about it, we are actively participating in, in serving, you know, child sacrifice to Baal and Molech. Mm. So it is so important that we know that, and we know obviously God um, hates those who shed innocent blood, but just to see the correlation, I've again known about Baal and Molech, but actually uh, as seeing the foundation uh, is really eye-opening and Father, we definitely want to study more um, and to know more so that we don't, um, we're, we're not ignorant of these things. That's right. That's one thing you can, especially in the end times. And we say we're in the end times because we are. We, one thing that we know is that we are certainly closer than anyone has ever been. All right. And so in these times, and especially in the world today, um, it's 2022. And there's this stuff popping off all, all over the planet that lets you know that we are definitely growing closer to uh, the return of Christ and the judgment on the world uh, because man is acting up they're acting a the fool I'm saying like I want to say they're acting a the fool and God's going to deal with that but the Bible says where sin abounds grace does much more abound so it doesn't matter how much sin is on the planet it doesn't matter how dark things get the children of light God's children will be out in the streets in the hedges and highways inviting others to come to God's kingdom and sharing the gospel which is the good news of Jesus Christ salvation is only found through him he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by him. And we are taking that good news, that invitation to others to tell them to come into the kingdom, come into the household of God and the family of God, just like we did. Um, all right, so I want to go ahead and share today's uh, inspiration um, to give you encouragement for today. It's out of uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and and petition with thanksgiving present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus and we want to take a second to understand this no matter what happens in your life it says do not be anxious about it but every situation you find yourself in pray which is just communication with God pray and petition give God your requests let God know what you need, what you're dealing with. And he says, when you do it, do it with thanksgiving. Thank God because he's faithful. And he deserves all glory, honor, and praise. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He will provide. And it says, present your request to him. 
Stop talking to people around you. Stop complaining and talking about your problems. Talk about how big your God is and go to God and tell him what's on your heart. And if you are in communication with God through every situation and everything that makes you anxious, if you are going to God with prayer petition, there's a promise. He says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which means that in the midst of the storm that you're in and people around you may be in similar storms, you will have peace around you. Why? Because it's God's peace. It's God's protection. It's God's mind and heart is in you. And you know God's going to work all those things out for your good, just like he's doing it for me. So in the midst of your storm, people will see you in that storm and see you at such peace. They're like, how in the world is Stephen at such peace? How in the world are they at such peace? Why? Because we've given our petition to God and we went to him with thanksgiving, knowing that he's going to deliver us. And so we have a peace in our heart, which transcends all understanding. And that will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Our hearts won't hurt. Our minds, we won't be confused in our minds, wondering what do we do, where we go, how's it's going to happen. We won't even do that. And I said this before, and I'm going to say it again, and we're going to end on this. But God is faithful. He says that if, if you diligently seek him, he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, I, I shared this in the last video, but I want to share it again. That we've been studying on sin, suffering, trials, the purpose of suffering, you know, and, and all those things. And how it actually affects everybody, not just sinners. I mean, that's something that impacts everybody. You know, because in this, the Bible said, what Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of, be of good courage. I've overcome the world, is what he said. Now, as soon as I started to rise and I started teaching on sin and we started studying on sin, I told my people, I told the Rise family, I said, there's a purpose for suffering. We know that suffering comes to teach us obedience to God. And trials and tribulations happen in all of our lives. But I told them, I said, now, as we start to go higher up the mountain of God, we know the enemy is not going to like that. Satan's not going to like that. And uh, he's going to attack. And sure enough, my son's car broke down. Right behind that, my car broke down. And within a week, I think it was within a week, my, my, my wife's car broke down. Right now, all three of us don't have a car. Just like no car. So how are we going to function? And so we just started dancing in the flames. We started just, you know, in the, in the midst of all the trials that we're going through, trusting God. And God's been making a way all the way through. And, and I've been telling, of course, the Arise family knows that we walk by faith and not by sight. That we don't care how it looks. We know God is God and he, he plans out our days. Tomorrow's in his hands. We need to be faithful today. And so anyway, we've been in prayer. You guys have been praying. Thank God for you. I thank God for you. Um, and, uh, and this past Sunday, we got a blessing. A lady at our church told, told us to come and pick up her car because she don't need it. She says her son can take everywhere she needs to go. And she asked us how long we need to borrow it. And then she told me, she said, you can just keep it for 30 days and then we'll talk about it. And this is the car that the Lord blessed us with right there. Brand new and uh, fully loaded. And just I just give glory to God. And we're driving this lady's brand new car. Why? Because she listened to the Lord and she sold it to our lives. So God is faithful. So no matter what you're going through, just trust him. Put your petitions before him. No matter how it looks, just trust him. No matter what. Good or bad, no matter what happens, still trust the Lord and watch what he does for you. And it will strengthen you because, you know, one thing that I teach is overcoming faith remembers past victories. So just remember what God's already done in your life to help you stand today and watch what he does in your life today because of your faith. All right. So, look, we love you here at the Rise Bible Study and Fellowship. We thank God for each and every one of you. We want you to continue watching and continue sending out these links to other people so that they can learn and be encouraged and grow in the Lord and understand who God is and who they are in God. We're thankful for you. Please continue to support Arise. We thank you for all your financial support, all your prayers, and uh, for joining us today. And we, we look forward for you to come back tomorrow. We'll Monday through Saturday, we'll continue our study at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time as we get into God's Word in the book of Genesis. We will see each and every one of you guys tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. God bless.